short arranging board meeting today after the service. Also, our business meeting and elections will be on March 10th, so put that in your calendar. And also, there's some exciting events coming up that brochures are up here. The softball benefit up in New Jersey, which is a great time, and some different Bible schools. So please come see the um, brochures up here. Brother Mike will encourage us this today with some words. Um, his subject will be prove it. And in preparation for his remarks, we're going to read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, who has believed what we have, what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silence, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He, sh he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. With that, I'll ask our brother Mike and give us some encouragement, thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see. Good morning to you. Uh, it's good to see everyone out today. Uh, as Dustin was saying, it's been a dreary day. It's been a dreary week, um, but it's good to be with all of you here today. Um, it's great that we have so many visitors with us, and it's great to hear of all the opportunities that we have to serve today and the announcements. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So the title of my talk is Prove It. Um, so the question, a couple questions I wanna start with. So why do we believe that the words in this book have meaning? What about this book is special? 
compared to other spiritual books. There are other spiritual books that have an explanation of the origins of life, they have historical context, and they speak on life after death. So what about this book is special? Now I could go around the room and ask all of you, I'm sure I would get some overlap with your answers, but there would definitely be some personal thoughts as well. A common response may be that the Bible contains a consistent message or an aligned focus throughout the book. That's something I would answer to those questions at least. But when I thought about it more recently, this isn't something that separates the Bible from other types of spiritual writings. Consistency is more of a product of quality writing and elegantly planned storylines than validity or truth. We see this in many books that we read in our leisure or movies or shows that we might watch or even other spiritual writings. What makes the consistency of the Bible unique is what its consistency has overcome. The Bible isn't really a book. It's a collection of books. These books were written across a thousand plus years, having been dated and widely agreed upon by historians. These books were written by a host of different people. Authors refer back to works that predated theirs and their narratives, while the dialogue of people constantly refers back to previous works. Referring back to things across time presents consistency but it doesn't ensure that the work is something worth believing, especially when this collection of books makes predictions about the future. A common desire for people seeking to trust someone or believe someone is evidence. We seek evidence. We have a lot of sayings about this in our culture. So I'll believe it when I see it. You have to earn my trust or prove it. I actually had, in, I had a job interview this week, and after I had the interview, I had to take this aptitude test. So basically the idea behind it is I'm telling this employer that I have these skills and capabilities. And, you know, on faith, he wants to believe me, but he's going to give me this test because he wants me to prove to him that I can do these things. Um, can I can, that I can do these things that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm claiming to be able to do. Well, the wonderful thing about the Bible is that God welcomes these thoughts that we have regarding this book. God knows that we need proof. God isn't asking us for blind faith when we, he asks us to believe. He invites us to put it to the test. Within books of the Bible, there are covenants made that are fulfilled. But more importantly for our discussion, there are many covenants and predictions fulfilled in later works that are dated hundreds of years after. And still, there are even more waiting for fulfillment. So I'm talking about this idea of prophecy. Now, just the word prophecy sounds a bit overwhelming and probably kind of grand. Uh, Webster defines prophecy as an inspired utterance of a prophet or a prediction of something to come. Now, the first definition sounds a bit sort of whimsical and fancy, uh, but the inspired part is kind of what we're hoping for when we're reading the Bible. We are saying that we believe that the Bible is true. We have to believe that its writers were inspired to write with instruction from God. And there is a passage that details this idea for us. Um, it's 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. So um, I am going to put all the references up for you guys. Um, if you want, staying in Isaiah 53 would probably be good this morning. I'll do some flipping around, but all the other references will be up here. So 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the second definition of prophecy is pretty simple. It's just a prediction of a future event. So 
my suggestion with the, with the word prophecy is to just kind of combine them both. So prophecy, an inspired prediction of something to come. Now, prophecy can be a scary thing for a person reading this book. The Bible is very rich in this regard with many predictions and connections across books, empire changes, and across long time horizons. But as deep as you can dive on the subject, and we, we're gonna stay in the shallow end today, I'll show you that. Um, there are many predictions that are made plain without a whole lot of effort. And thankfully, those are the ones that are most important. So the sliver of inspired prediction or prophecy that I would like to share with all of you this morning has a special meaning to me. Um, and it's in Isaiah 53, where our brother read for us. Um, and I'll tell you why it's been so impactful for me. So I, I grew up going to church in Sunday school regularly, and I'd undoubtedly read this chapter in Isaiah many times, or at least I'd heard it referenced. Um, but admittedly, I didn't really take it in or read it um, critically until a little bit later in my life. Um, but I, I remember the first time I really read this chapter vividly. I was 20 years old. I had decided to make a commitment to follow Jesus. I had decided to be baptized into his name, and I was preparing for the baptismal interview. This is basically a time when you share your motivation to be baptized and your understanding of the gospel message. I remember being at my Nana's house uh, with an older member of our church, and I'd grown up around this, this gentleman. He's kind of a grandfatherly figure to me. Um, and I just remember trading off verses with him. And uh, I just remember getting goosebumps after making that choice. Um, for someone that has heard about Jesus, someone who has read about the life that he led and the things concerning him, the connection is so plain to see in Isaiah 53. I just remember being awestruck at the detail in which Isaiah described Jesus, the Messiah to come. And with knowledge that Isaiah's writings had been dated as being written over 700 years before Christ was born, reading it was so confidence inspiring for me. Um, it was so impactful for someone preparing to make a commitment to Jesus. So today, this prophecy is about Jesus. And it's fitting because that's what we're here to do. We're here to remember Jesus. So we call this portion of our service the memorial service. It's our remembering time of Jesus. Now, I'll be honest, I don't completely love the title Memorial Service, um, mostly because we have all been to other memorial services that aren't about Jesus. A person dies and we get to console family, share good memories, and take time to personally reflect on our time with that person. I think my misgiving with the name is that it's somewhat commonplace. But there's a big difference between this memorial service and all others we might attend. Jesus is alive. All other memorial service that we go to, that person is dead. Now I understand that we do this to show the Lord's death until he comes, right out of First Corinthians. But without the resurrections of Jesus, the whole Bible is powerless. 1 Corinthians tells us our hope is in vain if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead. So I know I'm just being picky about the name memorial service. I realize that. But I just want to stress that this should also be a celebration of life. A celebration of new life. A remembrance of the newness of life that we hope to walk in. So my little angst being shared about the name. Uh, we, we set a time... We set aside time to remember Jesus, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he has in store for us. So today I'm going to talk about Jesus, and that, that, that tangent's over. So uh, I had Isaiah 53 read. Um, this has a unique connection with the New Testament. It's quoted, but in a peculiar way compared to the way most other references um, you know, reference back to the Old Testament. It isn't used in conversation. 
Someone is simply trying to read the chapter and understand it. So let's go over to Acts uh, 8, verses 26 through 35. I have this up on screen for you guys. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that, was, that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he, he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. I love the story about the Ethiopian eunuch. It's rich with detail. There is this foreign official who traveled to Jerusalem to worship, and he's trying to read Isaiah on a chariot. Then Philip is told by an angel to rise up and go to the desert and look for him. Then the Holy Spirit moves Philip to this chariot. And even later, Philip is swept away by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of bells and whistles to this story, but the truly meaningful part is so simple. Philip says to the Ethiopian, Ethiopian, what are you reading? Can you understand it? And he just says, how can I without any help? It's, it's incredibly simple. The man just wanted to understand what Isaiah was trying to tell him. He needed some help. You know, what a, great, what a great lesson for us, that is. For all the glitz and glamour of the story, the most important thing is Philip just asking somebody if he can help them out. And then he gets to tell them about Jesus. There's an exhortation in that alone. Um, I'm going to leave that there for now, but what a... What a profoundly plain lesson that is for us. So, so I, uh, I remember reading this passage when I was younger in Acts, uh, not as young as I'd probably like to admit, honestly, um, and wondering why he was reading Isaiah. And I thought at the time, I was like, you know, he probably just opened the Bible to the middle and then just started reading. And then Philip, you know, came along and was like, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you about that. <laughs> but of course, that's not, that's not what happened. Uh, there was no New Testament written yet. Like, there was no printing press. He most definitely just had the scroll of Isaiah. Um, and the only reason he had that is because he had a position of power and he, he had some money. So as silly as this thought is for my not-so-distant youth, uh, it does bring me back to our earlier thoughts, the idea of the Bible being a collection of books written across time. And what is important for us to consider is those verses 34 through 35. Philip, starting with this very scripture, tells this man the good news of the things concerning Jesus Christ. Philip tells the gospel message starting in Isaiah. So let's go there. Let's go to Isaiah and hear about the good news. And we actually have the benefit of the New Testament. Um, Philip and the eunuch were producing content for it at this time, so they, they couldn't use it. Uh, but we'll jump back and forth here. So I'm going to put the, the New Testament references up, and we can stay. You guys can stay in Isaiah. So our objective is to see what if what Isaiah is claiming is true. Do the things he is claiming happen in the future. Can God prove it? Is he trustworthy? 
Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. God watched him grow, and he came up like a, dro- like a root out of dry ground. Our New Testament reference is Matthew, Matthew 1. Uh, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Skip, skipping down to 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and she will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And we'll skip down to 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus was born from the Virgin Mary. He had no business being born. He came from nothing, as it would seem, from human terms. Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth to put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. All of the males in his region were killed because of Jesus. And his family fled to Egypt with them. And he was the, so he was the only male of that, of that age in Bethlehem. The next one is Luke 2, verse 39, 40. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. God watched him grow up, grow, and came up like a, droop, like a root out of dry ground. Hebrews 50, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Luke 4. 16 to 17, and then we'll skip down to 28 to 30. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Skipping down to verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. Jesus reads this passage in Isaiah and tries to tell his hometown the good news that he is offering, and they try to throw him off the hill. He's despised and rejected by men. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38. Then Jesus went with them to a place Oh, sorry. Let's read. Um, let's see. Okay. We'll read uh, Isaiah 53, verse 3 again. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 36 through 38. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. Just think about that statement for a second. His soul is sorrowful unto the point of death. Think about your worst sorrow, a time you were really dealing with grief. 
We've all had times when you had felt loss or sorrow, and if you haven't, brace yourself. Now, it's not a great practice to compare the way you feel or have felt. Now, it's not a great practice to compare the way you feel or have felt to someone that has felt much worse, seemingly. It can sometimes make people feel like they aren't allowed to feel an emotion because someone has felt something worse or had to overcome something much greater. Jesus doesn't want us to feel that way. We can come to him with all of our messiness, bring our burdens, and cast our sorrows upon him. But it is important to look at this, to thank him for enduring the sorrow, for suffering through the anguish of his soul, as we'll read later in Isaiah. And we should remember that his sacrifice is all-encompassing. He dealt with impending death on his mind throughout his life. It's so humbling to think about that aspect of how he lived. Isaiah calls him a man of sorrows. It's a description of his existence, not just for an instant or for his time on the cross, but he's describing his life. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Uh, Luke 22, verse 59 through 62. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly this man also is with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know who you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and remembered the saying of how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So I don't have verses for this one, but I just wanted to think of, you know, when we think of the, the wounds that were healed by, We know what Jesus went through. He was whipped, he was flogged, he was scourged. His cross was carried for him, and then he carried it himself. He went through so much for us. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on us, laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so so he opened not his mouth. Mark 14, verses 57 to 61. Then some rose up and and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands. Within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then, did their testimony agree? And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Luke 23, verses 8 and 9. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. He opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man and his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Mark 15, verse 25 through 27. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Mark 15, verse 42 through 43. 
And when evening had come, since it had been the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And I don't have the reference here, but Matthew 27 also refers to Joseph of Arimathea as a rich man. And then Matthew 27, 22 through 23. Pilate said to them, then shall, what shall I do with Jesus who was called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. There was no deceit in his mouth. He was guilty of nothing. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, verse 10 is a little different. It's... It's interesting. Um, I was reading this chapter with Lindsay a couple weeks back, and she made a great observation. She had a great question. She asked me why this chapter is written in past tense. So my gut reaction to this was that it was so surely to happen in the future that God moved Isaiah to write it as if it had already happened. That's not way off base, but after taking a closer look, it wasn't really a great answer. Isaiah 1 indicates that Isaiah had a vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So this was something he saw in a vision. Um, God gave him a vision, so he wrote from that vision. So that's why he's using the past tense. He had already seen some things happen. But in verse 10, we see a change in tense. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he has put him to grief. But now here is the change to future tense. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall prolong his days. He shall see his offspring, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. I think that this here, this change in tense, I think it was for Jesus. God's will for him is in the past tense. But he could read this and gain confidence to know what he had the ability to do what he was going to be able to do in the future. Let's go to Matthew 26, 39 to 46. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for the eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. My Father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus had to overcome this. He had to come to this moment and to realize that he could go through with it, that he could go to the cross as was his father's will, which was written in the past. He needed this confidence from Isaiah and from his father. When we read on in Isaiah 53, now that Jesus has come through his trial on the cross, he has these things to look forward to. Out of the anguish of his soul in verse 11, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He's going to make many accounted righteous, and we can be part of those righteous that are accounted. Therefore, in verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. 
because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes, trans, makes intercession for the transgressors. He's going to execute judgment for God and make intercession for his people. A high priest that gave himself once for the sins of his people, and he now works with us and takes care of us. So I appreciate your patience. I know we jumped around a lot there. Um, so through our journey this morning, we have sought out proof from God. Proof that we can trust him. The same kind of proof that we seek when we are trying to trust another person. We, don't have, we didn't have time to take a really deep dive, but the accuracy is plain to see in the time that we have spent. The Bible is consistent throughout. It has been written across a long time for us. It has made predictions that have been fulfilled in stunning detail in later works, which have eyewitness accounts. This is the point in which we develop trust for another person. We have faith that they will deliver on their promises. God has proved that he is trustworthy in every sense that we like to evaluate the trustworthiness of an individual. God has provided those attributes in his collection of works in this Bible for us. This is real. It's all real. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. and He is alive. Let's receive him, like Dustin was saying a couple weeks ago. God sent him in the world for us. He has been given all authority and power by his Father to carry out his work for us and for the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's easy to think about this as a sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, but that's not what the text says. He gave, us, he gave him to us then, now, and forever. Jesus is calling people out. Jesus is the good shepherd herding his sheep. And if we believe in Jesus, he will give us eternal life, a task he was given by his father. So one last reason why I chose to talk about this chapter in Isaiah is because how it's connected to me and my baptism. I think many of us who are baptized look back on that time with, with a smile. You were just sort of on fire for your faith, so excited about the good news about Jesus. And of course, you couldn't imagine for a second that the flame would ever wane down to a flicker, despite being warned by so many that had gone through this in the past. Um, how could this bonfire, this, this fire that I have ever, ever wane? Um, I hope that we have exceeded that excitement over time, and maybe some of us are at that point now. But for me, looking back on this chapter takes me back to that time when I first believed when I was fully convinced. And I hope this talk convinces you again. But I encourage you to seek out that thought process again, whether it was through a chapter, the words of Jesus, or the way a person sat with you and helped you understand. And use that to light your bonfire again. Paul Houghton sat with me. He wasn't guided by an angel as far as I know. He wasn't carried over to my Nana's house by the Holy Spirit. He drove his minivan over, and he definitely reminded me not to speed when I left that night. We weren't on a chariot, although that would have been awesome. Um, we just sat at my, navel, my Nana's table and drank coffee. He just sat with me and wanted to help. Who sat with you? Who are you going to sit with? Let's go back to Acts 8, just to finish up here. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, 
and he went on his way rejoicing. Thank you.